Hello, welcome to English 3, Unit 1, over American Literature, which covers early America through 1750. We begin this unit by studying three Native American works. The first piece we're going to study is called the Wallam Olam. The words Wallam Olam mean painted record, and it was a creation myth that was created by the Delaware. Um, what you'll see whenever we study this is a series of pictures called pictographs that um, have been interpreted finally to tell the story of creation. As we read the story, I think you'll see a lot of coincidences with our own creation story. The next work is a poet's poem entitled Listen, Rain Approaches. Listen, Rain Approaches is a Navajo poem, and it's a ritual poem that was used in order to um, bring rain uh, that was much needed for their crops. You'll notice when we read it that it has very simple language. It is repetitious, uh, often because they used oral tradition, the natives would use uh, the, the repetition so that it would be easier to remember. And of course you should remember that oral tradition is the art of passing literature through word of mouth. One thing a lot of the students notice on pages 12 and 13 of the text is that, that there's an image that appears to be sort of a, a swastika in reverse. And one of the things to bring up would be that in Native American cultures, the image originally is where, well, it's where the image originated. And it actually used to represent, and still represents for some cultures, the um, integration of peace. In the, between the four winds from north, south, east, and west, and how they all work together uh, to create harmony in the world. And then it wasn't until later that that image was taken and turned into something that was less pleasant. The next poem that we study from Native American literature is from the Ojibwa tribe. It's a love poem called Calling One's Own. As we read it, you will see a lot of natural comparisons um, a lot of imagery, a lot of similes, and a lot of metaphors. The next piece we read is from Christopher Columbus, and it's from his journal, which was kept as he made his way to the New World, um, in the, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Um, we do need to remember that because this is a first-person narration of his account, um, it's possibly that it's possible that he was an unreliable narrator. Um, we also need to uh, remember that he does actually describe lying to his crew primarily to present, uh, prevent mutiny um, as they made their way across the scary seas. He uses a lot of imagery to describe the sights um, on water and on land uh, after landing. And at the end, we're going to see that he celebrated the diversity that he found in the New World. The next piece we read is from John Smith. It is entitled, A Description of New England. And although that sounds very analytical, it actually is written as a persuasive speech. And we're going to see that as we go through um, the document. Um, Smith's primary goal in writing A Description of New England is to finance a trip to the New World. And he is going to make very clear in his work uh, the positive aspects of traveling to the New World with him. He is going to reach out to as many people as possible without angering anyone who might, um, who, whose help he may need. And so we're going to look at the elements that he, that he uses in order to make the piece a persuasive piece. William Bradford's Pilgrim's Progress is next. Bradford was one of the approximately 100 uh, pilgrims who made their way over to the New World on the Mayflower in 1620, and they landed at Plymouth Rock. The piece is divided into several parts. The parts that we will read um, would be, first of all, from the arrival, when he describes how difficult their travels were at sea, and how joyously they, um, they proclaimed God's goodness when they landed, despite the troubles that they'd had, because they had made it, uh, made it to the New World. The second part of the text is called the starving time, and approximately half of the pilgrims died before the end of the first winter because they had landed in the, in the dead of winter without a lot of amenities to take care of themselves. 
and they began to become very ill from a lack of vitamin C, developing scurvy. It was noted during that time that a lot of the sailors who brought the pilgrims over didn't treat them very well, but the pilgrims all treated, them, uh, treated one another with great love and even took care of the, the sailors when they became ill and um, demonstrated such a good Christian quality that the sailors were known to, uh, to, some of the sailors were known to convert as a result from seeing their Christianity and their positivity. Eventually, as the weather improved and the relationships with uh, the Native Americans improved, at first when they had landed, the natives would steal things from them and um, were not very friendly. But as the weather improved and they, they got to know one another, um, especially two Native Americans, Samoset and Squanto, um, they were able to develop a friendship. And this is where we talk about um, this, the first Thanksgiving together, where they all came together to celebrate um, being co-inhabitants of the New World. One of the only female writers that we have um, early on in the text is Anne Bradstreet. We're going to read a very short, sweet poem entitled To My Dear and Loving Husband. Bradstreet was a Puritan wife and mother, and it, it probably wasn't considered common for women to write at that point, but um, she did write from a very simple perspective. Uh, it was all, all of her works, I think, are very much based on godliness and an idea that our real treasure is in heaven. And she compares the loves that she has for her husband as being stronger than mines of gold. And we will see that she hopes that their love on earth will take them to an eternity together in heaven. Jonathan Edwards wrote two of the pieces that we have in the text. Um, he was a fire and brimstone, hellfire and damnation preacher. He used fear to motivate his con congregation heavenward. And we're going to read uh, In Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a sermon, a very famous sermon that he delivered in which he uses a lot of comparison, a lot of imagery um, in order to convince the congregation that they need to turn away from sin and to live lives entirely for God. In the piece, Edwards uses a lot of imagery, and it's, it's um, often very violent and very frightening. The images of being held over the pits of hell, the images of God holding the sinner like one would hold a spider. Um, and we're going to talk about the differences between this sort of imagery and message and what we teach and talk about in our own Catholic faith. Another piece that we're going to read from Jonathan Edwards is in sharp contrast to Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This one's called The Beauty of the World, and it's an essay that is written about how wonderfully made the world is and how no one paints, um, paints with as much beauty and ability as God does and how everything in the world works together, whether it's colors or whether it's the way that the, the stars and the skies and the day and the night and everything moves together just perfectly in only a way that God can. And at this point, after we finish Jonathan Edwards, we're going to be ready to take the test. If you look over this list of different, um, different words and phrases, these are all things for sure that you'll need to be familiar with by the time it comes to, uh, we come to take the test, and you might want to just review the information one more time. If you don't know any of these things, make sure you ask me, okay? And um, good luck. Let me know if you have any questions. God bless. Have a good day.